So right out the bat, we see that worship is a sacrifice. We see it in Genesis 22. We see where Abraham is asked to sacrifice Isaac, his future, his legacy, his prayers as an act of worship. And we see Cain and Abel gave everything they had, the stuff that they had worked hard for, tending to the lamb, tending to the earth, and making stuff happen. And they still say, God, we got to give it to you. So out of the bat, worship is, is sacrifice. It's sacrifice from our hearts to God to show him, I'm willing to give you everything. So the origin um, is something we need to really look at when worship begins, because many times we get away from the origin of worship and we kind of speed into these, you know, the ideas of 10%, the ideas of I'm going to go to church on Sunday. And these are all good things and things we should do. However, there's more to worship than just that. Worship um, requires simply and plain and simple is sacrifice. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 43, 7 says this, and I'm kind of uh, jumping the scripture of who is called by the name of God. We are created for his glory. We are created for his glory. So we are called by the name of God and we're created for his glory. Which lets I know, let us know that we're only created for one thing and that's to worship God. Watch this, in what? Spirit and in truth through our sacrifices for him. Yeah, it's cool um, to read our Bibles. Yeah, it's cool to do all that. And that's all the stuff we need to do to maintain our Christian walk. But at ultimate, what are we really sacrificing to get closer to him? Um, I work with a lot of youth. I'm a youth pastor at Gwinnett. And one of the hardest things for our youth to do is to give up TikTok or Instagram or uh, their cell phones even. Because those cell phones and some of the stuff that we put in front of God have become idols. And we love the idols so much more than we love God. I wonder how many church-going people have idols that they put up. Many times we see that in church um, circles and church denominations that a demographic of men tend to dip in the fall season. Do anybody know why it tends to dip in the fall season and the men and men going to church? Because football comes back. And when football comes back, men don't have time for Jesus. They have to barbecue. They have to get their house ready. They have to get their mind right. And I tend to say, hey, you can't give God some time to just come commune with the other believers, to sit and have your word, to, to do this first before you even sit your behind down on, on the couch and watch a couple of games with dudes who don't even know you exist. And you can't give God his due. So the question becomes more so that worship is not about music and songs and dance and all of that stuff is a part of it. It's not about just that, but it's rather worship is a lifestyle, our lifestyle, giving it to Christ. Worship is a life response to the worldly, uh, the worthiness of his object. Then how do we worship? We have to worship in, 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 in truth. We have to worship in spirit. Well, I'm going to say that again. Worship is a life response to the worthiness of Christ, of his objective. Like that's the objective is to show God how much he's worthy through our life. Sacrifice through our lifestyle is for us to show God how great and wonderful he is. And the only way we can do that as believers is through spirit and then through truth. Okay, well, Trey, you get it. I, get, I understand what worship is. Worship is a sacrifice. Worship is my lifestyle. But can you, we're still kind of confused on the spirit and truth part. Because when you hear Jesus say this, what does this even mean? Like when I was reading this and studying this, I'm like, okay, God, you want us to, you want the true worshipers to worship you in spirit and in truth. Well, I, I think I do it in truth. I'm a spirit, so I guess I'm doing it. Okay, so let me, so let me break that down to you. So let's start with the spirit. And the first thing you have to, you have to understand is God is a spirit and he ignites us and he energizes our spirit. So because um, one of the things that we recognize is that because God is a spirit, we can't box him in, that we also are a spirit. Because you got to remember in Genesis, what does it says that God does to Adam? He blows into his nostrils. So he puts uh, spirit into man and Adam comes alive. So we are too spirit. So it's not uh, something that we can just, you know, walk up and say, okay, yeah, I can. No, we should, our spirit should be energized. Our spirit should be connected with God so that we understand how then to worship, watch this, God better. If you remember your sin days, um, uh, if you remember when you was in the club or when, whatever you was doing, whatever your sin was, that you didn't want to stop doing that because your spirit was not necessarily connected to God. It wasn't until the Holy Spirit 
was um, put back into your heart through your confession and your belief that then your spirit got connected with God, that your sin that you used to do, it just didn't feel right anymore. It didn't taste good anymore. It didn't, whatever the case it was, because your spirit man was now connected and energized with God that no longer you could worship God this particular way. You had to uh, worship God better. You couldn't just do your sin and try to worship God. You had to actually start making cuts to cut that stuff off. Because when you are connected with the spirit of God, sin cannot dwell in. We are spirit, which means our worship is not just physical. Our worship is spiritual. It's not just about lifting your hands. It's not just about um, playing music. It's not about playing some worship music as you pray. But it's an actual uh, a spiritual uh, expression from our spirit man that helps us. It has no limits. You can worship God literally anywhere. I love it. I love the stories when I hear about people in their closet prayers, because that lets me know that God can work in a closet in your house, and he can work in a, a mega sanctuary. He can work um, on an island by yourself, and he can work on the moon somewhere if you're able for that opportunity. Nowhere, no matter where we are, our worship should always be with us because we're a spirit, and God is spirit, and he's not boxed into the church. So even in this COVID season, this... Um, platform of zoom and me teaching you this and you listening is an act of worship because we're not allowing the physical block or the physical uh, uh um restraints that we have to stop us from actually seeking god and worshiping john 3 6 says something that's very interesting jesus says this i think it's it's so true when it talks about worshiping god and spirit and truth it is so true jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh but what is born of the spirit is spirit so this, the flesh is here and it will go away, but our spirit man that remains will still be here and will still be able to commune and worship with God. Where? In heaven. That is our hope as Christians, that when we leave this certain earth, when we leave um, this certain things, that we're able to worship God, continue to worship God in spirit. See, that's the spirit part is that we should be working on our spirit man now so that we have a better understanding of how to worship God when we get to heaven. It should be automatic. I hope that it is. But most times, our spirit man is malnutrition. Um, we don't take care of it right because we're not worshiping God. We limit to where we worship God. We, we, we may say, okay, I can only worship God on Sundays. Why? Because that's when church happens. But you are the church. You're the moving church you, you you are the body of church and i try to explain this to people all the time if all people say hey i say all the christians said we're no longer going to church every church in the uh, in, in america will fail because they need people if everybody says we're going to just do at home church uh, me and my family the churches the community churches will actually fail because the reason community churches are so powerful are because the, the people are the church and worshipers true worshipers understand that hey that my spirit i can worship god uh, at Young Road, or I can worship God in uh, Gwinnett. I can worship God in Africa. I can worship God. I don't even care if there's it's countries that want to allow us to worship God. I'm still going to worship God. There are still ways I can worship God, and that's what I'm going to do. So um, true worship comes from spirit, and it's made alive. So true worshipers understand that it comes from the spirit and made alive, and it's sensitive by the quickening of the spirit of God. So watch this. True worshipers understand that their spirit gets quick and it gets encouraged and is alive. And they know that it's the spirit of God that kind of flame, uh, fans that flame in us. You ever been at a church one time and you and say you're worshiping and in in, in I call it the gathering sessions. We are worshiping and all of a sudden the worship song just feels different, right? It might be a song that the church song before and you know the words, they got them on the screen, right? But then when you sing it because of, you, you you know, what have you been doing that week or something has changed in your life? This song just means something different. Um, I had an experience where I was um, went to this um, predominantly white church and they were singing, but I was doing a study that week on just how big and great God is. And the song they were singing, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was in that song, it was describing how great God was. And I found myself tearing up in tears, not because, you know, like, you know, the spirit, maybe the spirit was following me. I don't know. But like, it was more so that I could remember that, oh my God, God, from the text that I read, from studying and actually aligning myself up with God's word, that God is so amazing. And then when I started 
to really think about how great God is, worship pour out of my heart. That I stopped singing the song and just can only say, God, you're so great. You're so amazing. And I was thinking about the word. I was thinking about his Bible, his sacrifice of Jesus Christ and worship began to out of flow. And that was in a gathering session. Well, later, a couple of weeks later, I began just to read and study the scriptures and I find myself tearing up again and worshiping God in my private devotion time because then I'm recollecting again on everything God has done. When you start to really look at Jesus Christ's sacrifice and how great he really is and how much he loved us. And I started to think about my own sins and own transgressions of what got me to be here. Then I started to think, wow, God. I cannot, I'm so shameful, but you're so worthy. I am not worthy and you're so magnificent. You're so just, you're so, uh, I blame you for so many things, but it was really me who kind of messed it up. My worship then was transforming right before my very eyes because the Bible began to come alive and my life, the word and the spirit began to all mingle together where I felt my whole room at that point was a sanctuary for God. It was an inviting space for the Holy Spirit and God to sit with me. And I can understand then that my worship was transforming what, I, what the Bible says. I was doing it in what? In spirit. And I was doing it in truth, according to the word. And many people, I didn't have any music going or anything. I'm just reading the word, praying and talking to God. And then the spirit man got so excited within me. The Holy Spirit got so excited in me that worship began to happen. And remember, worship is not just in something you do when you just have your Bibles out. But um, worship is... The very ultimate calling of a Christian is to show that God is to people. It's to show that we are believers. And that's a very act of worship as well. Now, now you, you have a better understanding of spirit, which is spirit is the very essence of who you are as a believer. Spirit is the thing that connects you with God. Spirit is the thing that keeps you grounded when you, you, know, you feel like wavering. Spirit is your, your intimate connection with God. All right. It's, but truth is a little bit easier. Truth is the very word of God. Like, that's the truth. So truth is easy to explain, explain because if you're going to worship, worship God in spirit, where are you getting the truth from? You're getting the truth from the Bible, the word of God. And what is, one of, what is as a true worshiper, what is the ultimate thing that we believe? John 14, 6, which it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I believe that. That's the truth. I know, what, I know what society says. I know what the world says. The world says, hey, there's multiple ways. You can't judge other people, their belief. You can't, and I'm not judging anybody, but I can tell you what my word, the truth says. And the big truth says, hey, there's only one way. I will pray for you. I will hope for the best for you. I'm not going to dog you for what you believe. I'm going to you know, um, so support you as a human being, but this is what I believe. And if you, if you try to alter my belief, I, I can't ride with you. I can't I can, I can commune with you and talk with you, but you're not going to change me because I'm connected to what I know is the ultimate truth, which is Jesus Christ is the only way to our Father, our Father in heaven. And then we start to see some things that I believe that help us understand truth a little bit more. Because the Bible then in Colossians 1 5 starts to say, hey, that the word of truth is the gospel. The gospel, the very thing of Jesus Christ is the truth. The four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the gospel. Um, to, hear you, to give y'all, so I'm reading a book called um, The Logic of God. Um, I, I, I'm going to mess up the guy's name, but it's the book called is, uh, um, The Logic of God. And in, in that, he says, there are five gospels. And he said this, I'm like, hey, 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 man, it's only four gospels. But he said, no, there are four, he said there's five gospels. He said, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you. And what he was saying is, before people read the first four, they're going to read one first, and that's you. So if you have truth inside you, but you're not portraying truth, then you're not portraying worship, which means people will never go read Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John. They would never understand the gospel. They would never come to be believers because the fifth gospel that they see does not look like the other four. And many of us will struggle with worship in our daily lives because we're not walking with the gospel, knowing that we are the gospel. And this kind of leads me um, to, see, to say this in James 118 when it talks about Jesus brought forth the word of truth. Jesus does this. And if Jesus was to bring forth the words of truth, then how much more are we are supposed to do that if we're his followers? And then if we're gonna bring forth the word of truth, then we have to go to um 2 Timothy uh 2:15, where it says, Hey, 
We must handle the word of truth, the word of God, the gospel with right. We have to do it righteously. We have to do it in the right way. We can't be up here <laughs> just making up stuff. If we're true worshipers, if you want to be a true worshiper, then the ideal of carrying the gospel holds high and true. You have to take it seriously. When you're opening up your Bible, it's not just to do it as a checklist to say that you read your word, but you're opening up your Bible to say, hey, God, I'm here to commune with you. I want to be intimate with you. I want to worship you with no cameras, no lights, no band, no nothing, but me and you. This is called me and you time. And God, I'm going to do this as an act of worship because I want to be intimately with you. Because I know I go to Berean, I know we have to take away some points, right? I do have three points um, that I would like to give you uh, to kind of help you in this matter. Is uh, when, when we, when we want to be defined as a true worshiper, how then should we worship? If we worship in the spirit and truth, what should it look like? And the first um, point, if I had to call it that, would be we should be worshiping God wholeheartedly. We should be worshiping God wholeheartedly. And then if you put in quotations next to it, that's emotionally. You should have some type of feeling when you're worshiping God. It should feel like something. It shouldn't be dead because our Jesus is alive. And because our Jesus is alive, we should be excited. We may be sad and remorseful due to our sins and our transgression, but we should be excited. We should be overwhelmed. It should be some type of emotion wholeheartedly that we should feel in the depths of our heart for Christ. It should be some intimacy here. It should be uh, 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 some kind of emotion here. And many of us, we fall short because um, if you're a stoic, I call my granddad, like my granddad, he's a stoic believer. All he wants is the word. He don't want nothing else. He don't want no music. He don't want no sound. And I get that. Hey, hey, you, I, call, I call people like that stoics. That means you want the word because you can worship with the word and I get it. I get it. I'm not knocking because I'm like that too. Just sometimes I'm like, sit down with the singing. Let's, I want to hear what God has to say, right? But then it's just, even when you opening up just the word, if you should, if you're reading the Bible and it's just like, you know, bland and boring, that's a problem. It should be some emotion. You should get excited when you're reading these stories. You ever read a story um, that you like, uh, for instance, uh, one of the stories I got taught was David and Goliath. And when I got older, I went back and read it for myself. Like, you know, I heard a generic version, but then I went back and read the actual ver version. This story is a bloody, gory story. It's really, it's not a kid's story. Is a story about a young man killing a guy and chopping his head off. I mean, and this is what we teach in, <laughs> in Bible school. This is what we teach in Sunday school. And then when you, but they, mm -hmm. when you go back and read it, you see how David's excitement and dedication to the Lord was, hey, you're not going to talk about God like this, and I'm going to prove it. That's crazy. So we should have some kind of emotional connection with God in our worship. Also, we should, if we want to be true worshiper and we're going to worship God in truth, and in spirit, we have to have some intellect. It should be intellectually, intellectually. So it should be wholeheartedly. It should be intellectually, which is mentally, mentally. So in next to intellectually, put mentally. So you have wholeheartedly, emotionally. You have intellectually, mentally. What do you mean? You should be thinking about stuff. You should be studying to find yourself approved. That's what the Bible says in Timothy. It's a study to find yourself approved. I think in Peter, it says, uh, you want to be a worksman. You, you want to figure these things out. You want to know something. You should have, um, Peter says, you should be ready to give an, a gentle answer on, <laughs> for, for what you believe. And if that's the case, how do you get there? You have to study it. True worshipers are studying the word. True, wor true worshipers feel something when they read the text. If you can read, Matt, if you can read the crucifixion of Christ and not get teary-eyed, that's a, that's a problem. If you, can watch the, if you can watch the passion of Christ and be like, Dang, that's messed up. That's a problem. It should be some kind of emotion when you read the Bible. It should be some kind of intellect of knowing what was that suffering like for Christ? What was that, these, these stories in the Old Testament, how hard was that journey for them? You should be digging deeper. Have a study Bible at hand. You should be asking people questions who, who, who've been to school. You have, you have plenty of resources. You should be investigating the biblical text, not to undermine it, but to get closer to your Christ, to get closer to your Lord, to get closer to your master. And lastly, the last point that I have, uh, and then I'm kind of shift tones real quick and, and I'm going to get y'all out of here, is holistically, which is spiritually and physically. So technically, you, you, if you're a true worshiper, you should be worshiping God in spirit and truth wholeheartedly, emotionally. Then you should be worshiping God um, intellectually, which is mentally. And then you should be worshiping God in holistically, which is spiritually slash physically. 
everything that's in you should be worshiping God. Everything. There are no days off in your worship. I know many believers tend to believe that, that, hey, I had a bad day when I flicked somebody off on 285. No, you had a bad worship experience because that person didn't see Jesus when you did that. When you're having issues in your marriage, are you showing Jesus? When you're having um, issues in friendships and relationships, are you showing, holistically showing Christ? I get it. You're going to need a break sometimes. I get it. I'm not saying be perfect. But many of us, when we fall, we, sh we should be able to use the word to get us back up and guide us in the direction that Christ wants us to go. There are no perfect Christians. I'm not perfect. But I know, hey, when I mess up, I have to recognize immediately, hey, this was out of the will of God for my life. This does not represent him well. So because it doesn't represent him well, I really have to bow down to what his word says. Why it says, that is the sacrifice of my pride. And remember when we talked about this earlier in this lesson, that worship is nothing but a sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice my pride to get back in line with what Christ has said. Hey, if, if you fail to do any of these things properly, worship God, it often leads to idolatry. Failing to worship God means I'm not worshiping God here. I'm going to do my own thing over here. And because whatever that thing is, is more important than what God has called me to do. And when that happens, then that normally means whatever that thing is, is better, more than, greater than, more attractive, more intimate for you, uh, more loving to you than God is. Whether it's your football team, basketball team, wife, children. And people ought tend to think that you can't put children above God. You can. You people tend to think they can't put their, you know, their spouse above God, but you can. Your job before God, you can. And often in our culture and churches, we're suffering because as God's creation, he has called us to worship him, but we no longer worship him in spirit and truth, but rather we worship him out of obligation. We, 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 we worship him out of our checklist. I got to get up in the morning and go to church. Check. I got to read my Bible. Check. I got to, I got to do this thing. Check. But many of us are not worshiping God with the idea of I love him and I must worship him. Watch this. I should be worshiping him before I get to the church and I should be worshiping him after I leave the church. When I go to my job, I should be worshiping him. When I ride in my car, I should be worshiping him. Many believers are not true worshipers because we cut off when we worship God. Come on, if we're being honest and real, sometimes we take a break. We say, hey, I don't want to worship God right now. I want to hang out with my friends. I want to, I want to let my hair down. I, I just, I'm right there with you. I get it. Because I have to keep it kind of like, Trey, you, you got to keep your worship on, bro. No, God, time out. Can I just, can I not be a Christian for this hour? <laughs> right? I'm just keeping it real. And many times we, keep, we try to get back into it. And then when we get back into it, we're like, oh, God, I'm sorry. I kind of, I didn't, I went too far. Because normally that's what sin does. When we try to find ourselves tripping up in sin or getting, sin never wants you to like, what, what's the favorite saying? If I give you an inch, you take a mile or a yard or whatever. That's how sin is. Sin's like, you gave me an inch, pew! And that's how you know you, you're on the altar of repentance because you went too far. And now you have to reestablish your worship and your relationship with God in a manner to help you get back on track because you put some stuff above God. The lack of true worship in church, this, this is really what we're seeing in our society. Let me give you this. I'm almost done, I promise. The lack of true worship leads to this. Self-worship, which we see on social media, on Instagram, and different stuff like that. That's the first thing we see, is that when you have lack of true worshipers, we see that self-worship, people want their backs padded all the time. People always want to say something good about themselves. They're not really honoring others because all they can think about is them. We see that in Adam and Eve. What did they do? They did it for themselves, self-worship. Watch this. The second thing we see is self-centeredness. They all they think about is them. They're not trying to do anything. If y'all, I don't know, I don't see this as much, but it was times where people, when women were getting beat up by dudes and people are not helping her, they're filming it. Why? Because they want their videos to go viral. What? <laughs> it's been situations where we're seeing now that stuff is happening in our society and people are trying to defend themselves. Because in a society where true worshipers are lacking and there's no true worship in the church, people will only think about themselves. And then watch this. Ooh, I hate this one. It leads to a lack of true worshipers lead to self-destruction. That's why we see the suicide rate in America going up across the world. It's going up because people are so self-worshipped and they want self-worship so much and so self-centered 
that when they're not getting that praise, when they don't feel accomplished because they're not connected to God who already gave them the promises of them, then what happens is they, they tend to self explode because they need more than they, they know they already have. Like that God has given them everything. They don't know that. So they self-destruct. This is why people have, not all the time, but I think uh, me personally, this is my opinion, that sometimes people have mental breakdowns. That's completely healthy. They don't know mental health issues or anything. They break down, have anxiety and all this stuff because they haven't, it hasn't been God-centered. It hasn't been Christ-centered. It's been them-centered. And now they want to blame God because their success or whatever has fallen. Worship is the first form of our purpose to God. This is very important. I'm about to conclude. Worship is the first form of our purpose to God. It leads to our overall purpose and fulfillment in Christ. I'm gonna say that again, because that phrase um, is big to me. Worship is the first form of our purpose to God. It leads to our overall purpose and fulfillment in him. So watch this, the sacrifice that we make in, to get God's attention, the sacrifice that we make to honor God, it often leads to our purpose in God. And that's when we fulfill. And that's when we find ourselves finding happiness and joy when we're being fulfilled by God and God is filling us back up. This is why you see some old OG saints who say, hey, they have lost people, they lost things. And they say they, their faith in God is staying consistent, if not grown, because they know that God is continuing to fill them. This is why we read the story of Job and we're just astonished at how Job can go through all that and not be wavered and moved and not blame God, but instead look at himself and say, God, what have I done? If I've done anything to offend you, then I repent. And he didn't. But in, it's the mentality. And then when you're worshiping God in spirit and truth, you will be fulfilled in your purpose and in him. And you will experience true bliss, joy, and happiness. Watch this. Even if a storm comes, even when a storm comes, you should be able to say, God, God got me. What am I worried about? Yeah, I can't pay my bills. Yeah, COVID kind of threw my life apart. And I, you know, I, but God has me. Even if things are falling apart left and right, true worshiper understand this. Hey, God got me. True worshipers search for opportunities to worship God in all areas of their life. Not just one aspect of their life, of themselves, but they're looking for ways to worship God in all areas. In all, can I be a better husband, a better father, a better mother, a better sister, a better brother, a better friend, a better uh, Christian? Can I be a better employee, worker, co-worker? These people are looking for multiple ways to, to worship God in every setting. They don't cut themselves off. They don't hide certain things of themselves from God, even like, like, like we can, right? But they don't try to. Last thing, let me leave you with this. And I think it's one of the most beautiful scriptures and one of my favorite Psalms um, in the Bible is this right here, Psalms 27, four. Only one thing that I ask from, from the Lord, and, that only, and the only thing do I seek is that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his temple. I'm gonna read that one thing, one more one more time, because it's such a beautiful scripture for true worshipers. And it says this, Psalm 27, 4. One thing that I ask the Lord, ask from the Lord, is that, and that's the only thing that I seek, is that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon his beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. How beautiful is that as a worshiper? And as a worship, as true worshipers, that's that's our motto, that's our mission. Is that we want to worship God in the spirit and truth, not replace worship with missions, not replace worship with doing stuff, not replace worship with acts, but replace, but keeping worship at the front, at a frame eye and our forefront saying, God, I just want to dwell with you. Let's pray. And dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity of being such a great, amazing God before us. God, open our hearts to be true worshipers to you. As we think about, as we grow ourselves, we don't want to put anything idly above you because you are our God. You are our master. We bow down to your will. Yes, yeah, sometimes it sucks, God. Of sacrificing our pride, sacrificing our will, sacrificing our way. But we trust you as true worshipers to say, hey, guide me the way that you see fit. You created me to worship you. You created me to give you glory. So God, I stand in awe of you and I trust you with your, with your plan for my life. Matter of fact, you said in your word that man makes plan, but God directs the path. So God, the plans that I even make don't even make sense because you're going to still direct me on the path you want me to go. And I trust that direction. I, my whole life and 30, young, 32 years young, I understand, God, that I've made so many mistakes because I didn't trust your plan. I didn't trust your path. I didn't do anything I was supposed to do. But God, I come to you saying thank you for humbling me, keeping me humble, 
keep me in tune with you as a true worshiper so that I may know how to move before you. I don't want to hide any aspect of my life. I'm sure many people on this Zoom call don't want to do theirs either. So God, open us all up to what you have, your will for our lives, so we can be true worshipers amongst you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I don't know. We have a little time for um, Q&A, but if you want to ask me some questions, I could probably give you about five good minutes of just some questions. Um, so uh, anybody got any questions or want to say anything, ask something. No, I just I'm have good. a question. When you said, um, when you told us, Worship is the first form of our purpose to God, at least our overall purpose and fulfillment. Um, what was the rest of that that you said? I didn't catch what you said. Oh, I'm sorry. That might, I think you might have hit it on the head. Uh, it's the, it's the, and this is something I just thought about. Worship is the first form of our purpose to God. It leads to our overall pur purpose and fulfillment in him. So okay. it, leads, it leads to our overall purpose and fulfillment in him. Okay. Thank you. This was good. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. God be the glory. I, mean, it's just, I just like the word, <laughs> like the Bible. <laughs> so it's so interesting. So if yeah, if any more questions, then, you know, feel free to, you know, enjoy the rest of your day if you got off. All shout outs to people who got off today. I, appreciate, I always appreciate holidays for no reason. That's what I call them. So, <laughs> so. All right, good, good, good time, people. I appreciate y'all. If you tune in to more, they got more sessions coming later this month. I'm sure y'all all gonna be blessed. So you know, take your notes. Keep keep your notes. This is my notebook, a little Star Wars notebook. Keep your notes, so you can always go back. Star Wars notebook. All right, thank you. No problem. Y'all take care. All right.